Hello, everyone. Greetings. My name is Bernadette Andrea, and I am very honored to be delivering the presidential address in this, the 51st annual meeting of the Shakespeare Association of America. <laughs> Thank you. As I reassured a colleague on an SAA plenary podium several years ago, a little bit of stage fright is potentially a good thing, as it can energize a performance. Of course, we all know that too much can be paralyzing. Since speaking to this illustrious gathering of Shakespeareans has me wavering between a bit and too much, I'll take comfort in a nugget of wisdom from a veteran of the public stage, namely the epilogue to Shakespeare's late play with Fletcher, Henry VIII, or All is True. Tis ten to one this play, or this speech, can never please all that are here. Some come to take their ease and sleep an act or two. But those we fear, we frighted with our trumpets. So, tis clear, they'll say, tis not. Others, to hear the city abused extremely and to cry, that's witty, which we have not done neither. So, whether you are nodding off sated with the meal we just shared, perhaps adding to the effects of a late night after the annual reception, or with the boost of coffee and dessert ready to rush the microphone at our upcoming plenary, I hope you'll lend your hands as I fulfill the first of my tasks here, thanking the many people who have made this year's conference possible. To start, I want to share a land acknowledgement from the Native Governance Center of Minneapolis that I received from the co-chairs of the Local Arrangements Committee, Penelope Gunn from McAllister College, St. Paul, Minnesota, and Mary Truel from St. Olaf, College, Northfield, Minnesota. In the words of this native-led organization, Mini Sota Makoche, Minnesota, is the homeland of the Dakota people. The Dakota have lived here for many thousands of years. Anishinaabe people reside here too and reached their current homelands after following the mega shell to the food that grows on water, manumin, or wild rice. Indigenous people from other native nations also reside in Minnesota and have made innumerable contributions. You can go to the website of the Native Governance Center for their complete land acknowledgement and to learn how you can support these indigenous communities. The Local Arrangements Committee represents colleges and universities from across this region which are listed in the program. We thank all of these individuals and their institutions for their support. The program committee for this conference began its work a year ago, and we are most appreciative of their efforts. Michelle Dowd and Stephen Guy Bray co-chaired this hardworking committee, which was charged with reviewing submissions and curating the program. 
We thank them and the rest of the committee, Brandy Adams, Ambarine Dadaboy, Hillary Eckland, Don Rodriguez, and Penelope Woods for the dynamic and diverse array of seminars, plenaries, and special events at this year's conference. And these are all listed in our brand new conference app. And you can find the QR code so you can download the app at the registration desk. The Digital Exhibits Committee, chaired by Whitney Tretien, continues to extend our conference offerings into virtual spaces. We thank Whitney and the rest of the committee, Emily Bart, John Ladd, and Christopher Warren for their innovation and vision. Please join me in a round of applause for all these colleagues. <laughs> we, we are deeply grateful to the staff that runs the show behind the scenes, all of whom are, are at this year's conference. We invite you to stand or wave and be acknowledged if you are in the room. Karen Raber, Executive Director. Baiki Beatrice Lay, Assistant Director. Donna Evan Kasef, Program Associate. Anna Freeman, Project Coordinator. <laughs> Melody Fetsky, Financial Advisor. There she is. Anna Hegland, Social Media Intern. And Iris Sen, Graduate Student Assistant. Thanks to you all. Thanks to you all. Last but not least, on behalf of the SAA members and their guests at this meal, I want to issue a heartfelt thanks to the hotel staff and workers whose efforts have made our time together so enjoyable. Let's show them our appreciation. At this point in an SAA presidential address, the tone turns reflective. Reading through the archive of my predecessor's speeches available on the website, I was reminded of tragic losses, important firsts, hilarious moments, who could forget Dipna Callahan's speech, erudite Alan and significant milestones in the growth of this organization from its founding in 1972. I was particularly reminded of the generosity of Anthony Tony Dawson when I read his presidential address from 2002, which he delivered in this very city. A few years prior to his presidency, he sponsored me for a postdoc at the University of British Columbia, where I continued my study of Arabic, a heritage language for me, and began work on my book, Women and Islam in Early Modern English Literature. He was not a specialist in these fields, but he enabled my pursuit of them. Practicing what he preached in his presidential address, in his words, one of the great virtues of the SAA has always been its openness. Let us hope to our own past as well as to new people and new ideas. When I learned to my surprise that I had been elected to the executive committee, 
and the prospect of delivering a speech at this luncheon loomed. I began to reflect how I fit into the SAA and what I could bring to this moment. Like many of you, over the decades, when I had less travel funding and more household responsibilities, my son is now grown up, I toggled between the conferences of the Shakespeare Association of America and the Renaissance Society of America a timing issue that the Board of Trustees continues to work on. I have taught Shakespeare my entire career, starting in graduate school, and have published on his early and late plays, seeking to approach him from the margins. I even have an article on a Turkish woman dramatist who casts Shakespeare as a sheikh or a revered elder with a spiritual dimension. My point of departure has been gender and empire stretching across what Ottomanist Daniel Goffman calls the greater Western world. And my primary archive has been early modern women's writing in multiple languages. That said, from my first seminar 20 years ago, to which I contributed a paper on Della Riviere Manley's Almina, or the Arabian Vow, and the genealogy of feminist Orientalism, my work has been welcomed by fellow travelers and new friends at the SAA. Since that paper, I have collaborated with four outstanding scholars in organizing seminars. Bindu Maliakul, Linda McJennett, twice, Patricia Akimi, and Hamid Arvis. In my experience, the collaborative spirit of the SAA is unsurpassed, and we always seem to incorporate meals into our plans. An important touchstone for all my work has been the scholarship of Leeds Barrel, who has been recognized year after year in presidential addresses as our distinguished founder to recall Rebecca Bushnell's 2015 speech. As Phyllis Rankin shared in her 1994 speech, he even took out a personal loan to cover the startup costs. And while I hope all of you will contribute what you can to the SAA annual fund, no one expects you to follow this precedent. <laughs> My first thought was to acknowledge Leeds Barrel for providing a model for many of us to range widely across Renaissance early modern studies and still find a home at the SAA. In the interim, he passed away on April 22, 2022, <clears throat> shortly after our last conference. He was approaching his 95th birthday. I did not know him personally, as many of you did, but I learned much from the tributes by his co-workers and students who, pra who praised him as a teacher, scholar, visionary, administrator, editor, colleague, mentor, friend, in the words of Anne Jenna Lee Cook. And I was moved by the obituary from his family, which recalled with love and gratitude, and I'm quoting, Professor Verrill required that prior to entering seventh grade, all of his children must spend the summer writing 300 word themes every day or reading 100 page selections from classics after which an oral report 
had to be defended in the face of Professor Barrell's detailed questions. <laughs> Professor Barrell was a perfectionist, and as far as he was concerned, there was no truth to the opinion that the liberal arts are lacking in rigorous methodology. And that concludes the obituary. While I will be brief in what follows, as we have a plenary awaiting us, I hope my reflections will lead some of you to discover and for others to return to Leeds Barrel's scholarly oeuvre as our best tribute to his enterprise, persistence, and imagination to endorse Russ McDonald's accolades from his 2011 presidential speech. Barrel published his magisterial study, Artificial Persons, The Formation of Character in the Tragedies of Shakespeare in 1974. Already interdisciplinary in his approach, covering psychological, sociological, and philosophical theories of the mind, he states in his preface that much of the material in the early chapters was first presented in the perhaps seminars sponsored by the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine in 1967. Reviewers described this first monograph as learned, ambitious, fascinating, and erudite. They demurred only on the difficulty of the language, which was a symptom of his engagement with new critical theories in relation to older literary texts. By the time he published his second monograph 10 years later, Shakespearean tragedy, genre, tradition, and change in Antony and Cleopatra, he had honed his critical style into one of the most eloquent opening passages I have encountered in a scholarly book. In his words, life is not like tragedy, at all. In life, good young men and women die in air crashes or waste away from cancers, burn to death in hotel fires, or in explosions aimed at others. Young and old also suffer from malnutrition, jailing, or torture if they have not already died before puberty from hurtling cars driven by drunks, or from the sadism of enemy troops, or friendly neighbors. And from all this chaos of starving populations, burning cities, plague in Periclean Athens, eruptions of Vesuvian volcanoes, collapses of gnosis and civilization as we knew it in Crete, the art of drama can glean little that appeals. For the mere photography of such scenes cannot often capture beauty. Relief has come from the reshaping. The balance of this profound book treats Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra as its case study for such reshapings adding immeasurably to my understanding of this problematic play and of the function of art in our own troubled times. Another book that impacted me as I canvassed Barrel's oeuvre for this talk was his award-winning third monograph, Politics, Plague, and Shakespeare's Theater, The Stuart Years, which was published in 1991. This prescient study continues the interdisciplinary interface between medicine and literature that Beryl initiated in his first book. He takes his reader through a fascinating excursus 
on the epidemiology of bubonic plague in Shakespeare's era and the social mechanisms, including frequent lockdowns, used to manage it. His overall argument runs counter to the meme that circulated during our own recent lockdowns that Shakespeare wrote King Lear during a plague, so why can't you, one, write a book, two, new, learn a new language, three, train for a marathon, ad nauseum. As Beryl establishes through meticulous historical analysis, Shakespeare wrote in verse while the theaters were open, not when they were closed, reinforcing for us the indispensability of our associations with each other, including the SAA. As I was beginning my academic career, I eager, eagerly awaited the publication of Beryl's fourth book, his groundbreaking biography of Anna of Denmark, Queen of England, which appeared in 2002, sorry, in 2001. Along with its implications for my work on women, race, and empire, what struck me as I wrote in my review of this book was Beryl's salutary reminder that artistic production was not the highest end to which Anna or any other politically oriented figure might aspire an imperative that the culturalist bias of literary criticism tends to efface. This insight gave me much needed perspective as I moved into administrative positions later in my career that resulted in institutional change even if they took me away from my research for a time. Again, Leeds Barrel was a role model in his extensive service to the profession, including his position as the inaugural executive secretary of the SAA, his founding and editing of two scholarly journals, Shakespeare Studies and Medieval and Renaissance Drama in England, and his directorship at the Division of Research Grants at the National Endowment for the Humanities. To round out this homage, I fondly recall my attendance at the 2002 conference that Leeds Barrel organized at the Folger Shakespeare Library. The impact of the Ottoman Empire on early modern Europe, which was a landmark event. He even arranged a reception at the Embassy of Turkey in Washington, D.C. His own work in this field appeared in the collection Remapping the Mediterranean World in Early Modern English Writings, to which he contributed the essay Mythologizing the Ottoman, the Jew of Malta, and the Battle of Alcazar. The Fetchrift from 2006 dedicated to him, Center or Margin, Revisions of the, of the English Renaissance in honor of Leeds Barrel showcased the fields, the range of fields he covered with sections on England at the margins, researching the Renaissance, the human figure on the stage, and artificial persons, all titles from his papers, publications, and seminars. I regret that he was not able to finish his planned fifth book, Cultural Intertextualities and the Early Modern Reception of Drama, which deals, as Cook states in her tribute, with the effect of audience awareness of rumors, news, and stories related to the Mongols, the Ottoman Empire, Russia, and Spain. In his own presidential report for 1985-86, he writes, for at some point, 
all of us who are reading or listening to, the present screed, despite our most ardent hopes, will be gone. Our intellectual heirs will either be casually going to meetings on other planets or picking their way through the rubble of a new medievalism. Whatever their situations, their students should not be forced to embark upon laborious studies to rediscover long-hidden truths buried in our own neglect. I hope an enterprising researcher will plumb the barrel archives and write a historical life, a term he himself preferred to biography, of this generous and generative scholar. Before turning to this year's winner of the J. Leeds Barrel Dissertation Award, a task for our new president, the incomparable Ian Smith, I want to, th I want to thank, we can clap for him in a little bit, or now and later. I want to thank the outgoing trustees, Patricia Akimi and Dennis Britton. You can break out into applause whenever you so choose. As well as our stalwart immediate past president, Farah Kareem Cooper. I acknowledge the continuing trustees, Jane Wong Degenhart, Michelle Dowd, Stephen Guy Bray, and Vin Nardizi, and welcome our new trustees, Vanessa Corradera, Drew Daniel, and Wendy Beth Hyman. Go ahead. I congratulate our new Vice President, Ruben Espinoza. And I invite Ian to come to the stage. <laughs> 